Welcome to our final lecture on bioethics. This is the last lecture for week one. Um, this is on a paper by David Benatar called Why Coming Into Existence is Always a Harm. So he's going to argue that because, bring, because, as he claims, bringing someone to existence is always a harm, and he'll argue for that, it's always going to be wrong to have a child, right? Um, so interesting, confusing claim. This is sort of the, this is when philosophy is fun, and this is, I think Bertrand Russell said, a, a good philosophical argument is one that starts with premises that are obviously true, and in, you end up with a conclusion that's must be false, right? That's just shocking and bizarre, right? So this is one of those, right? It's, you probably find that claim surprising, that it could never be moral to bring someone into existence. So we'll see how he gets to that conclusion. All right, so as I said, he's gonna argue that it's always wrong to have children. Here is God, right, bringing Adam into existence. Um, we have a similar power, right? We are little gods and that we can also bring beings into an existence. Um, and what is what is the moral status of that power? Um, so if you can argue that coming into existence is always a harm, however it happens, um, then uh, it should entail that it's always wrong to have children, which is one way of bringing beings into existence. Um, since you shouldn't harm people, right? You know, other things being equal, right? Sometimes you have to harm someone to help them, but in general, harming other people is a bad thing. And if bringing into existence is a harm, then that's a bad thing. Um, but he has to make a few arguments, a few clarifications. First one has to do with the notion of personal identity, right? Because we're talking about people existing or not existing. And it can be odd to talk about people who don't exist, right? Because who are you talking about then, right? There's no one to even talk about. So this, this brings up funny, fiddly issues all over philosophy, right? The issue of non-existing beings. So we have to make some clarification about what we mean in those cases. So personal identity and non-existence. Uh, so this issue often comes up, right? You may, if you, at some point in your life, you either have or will um, debate whether to have a child and when to have a child, right? Um, you may think back on your own life and think, oh man, if I'd been born in the 60s, that would have been great, right? Or if I'd only been born 10 years later, um, things would have been better or worse. And it seems like that sort of speculation makes sense in a way, right? Um, but on one way of sort of regimenting what it means uh, to be the person you are, those sorts of speculations actually don't make sense. So Benatar, um, this is a relatively popular way of carving out what it is to be you. And he says personal identity is going to personal identity is going to be defined at least in part by the particular sperm and egg that came together right to create you when you were uh, conceived. Um, it has to be just that sperm and just that egg, right? If it was a different sperm and the same egg, different person, different different egg, same sperm, different person, right? So given the way that um right uh, uh ovulation works right you you got a different eggs every month so if, if you were conceived a month later different person um you would have different gametes as we say so by the gametes we just mean that the sperm and the egg um so what that entails is that it actually is nonsensical to think about oh man what would i be like if i was born right 10 years earlier or 10 years later or even a month earlier or a month later um that wouldn't be you Right? It would be a different person. And so that question of like, what would, it, what would it be like if I was born a different time doesn't even make sense. You couldn't have been born at a different time, right? You only could have been born at that same time. Now, you know, maybe you freeze the egg, freeze the sperm or something and do it later. But as on the typical, most people's the way they were conceived, right? Um, yeah, that's just not an option. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. That's sort of, sort of he's, Assuming that account of personal identity, if you end up wanting to write a paper that objects to Benatar, um, there's certainly other accounts of personal identity, right? So you could try to push back on that, um, either just that specifically as your paper or maybe as a means to questioning some other of his arguments that follow from that, right? But at least that for his purposes, he's sort of stipulating that. 
Okay, so if we accept that account of personal identity as it's been sketched so far, um, you might say, Benatar, you're already in trouble, right? Because you might think that you could develop an argument that it coming into existence is never a harm, right? That it's always a good thing to bring someone into existence. Um, and that would follow from, right, this account of personal identity plus an extra claim, which is the claim, which is a definition of what it is to harm someone, right? Um, so you might say to harm someone is to make them worse off than they would have been otherwise, right? Well, that makes sense, right? That's a plausible definition of harm. But if that is our definition of harm, um, then when we apply it to the question of bringing someone into existence or not, um, the otherwise situation is non-existence. And that's a non-state, right? There is no otherwise. Um, so that would seem to entail that you could never harm someone by bringing them into existence because you could never make them worse off than they would have been because they wouldn't have been, right? All right, here's that same argument formalized in premises. Um, premise one, for something to harm somebody, it must make that person worse off. That was just the definition of harm that we were considering. Um, two, the worse off relation is a relation between two states, right? You're in state one, um, which is how wherever good on, on a scale of one to 10, it's a good seven. And if you harm someone, you put them in another state, right? That's uh, less than seven right whatever that means right but that's the idea it's a, it's a relation between two different states that you could that you're in that you could have been in or that you were in you're now in um so premise three thus therefore right that follows from those two that for somebody to be worse off in some state such as existence the alternative state with which it's compared must be one in which he is um less badly or better off right um Okay, so again, it's just this relation between states. In one, you're better than the other, and if you harm someone, you make them in a worse state than they would have been. Uh, but the problem is non-existence is not a state that anybody can be in, right? It's the absence of all states. Um, so you can't compare it with putting someone into existence. Therefore, coming to an existence can't ever be worse off than not being in existence. Therefore, coming into existence can never be a harm. Right, so that seems to follow straightforwardly if we assume this account of harming someone as being a change, right, a relation between these two states. What can Benatar do about this? This would cut off his whole argument, right? He can't argue that bringing someone to an existence is always a harm if it can actually never be a harm, right? So what can he do about this? Okay, there's a couple options. Right. Um, it's certainly uh, this is not the only account of harm, right, that you could work with. So um, you could just deny premise one and say, no, harm is is not a sort of relation between states. It's not making someone worse off. Uh, what it is is just you're making it bad for them when the alternative wouldn't have been bad. Right. Um, this can work for non-existence because non-existing isn't bad. Right. Not existing is nothing. Right. So can't be good or bad. So a slight right uh, change in basically the wording of how we define harm, and then it's really no problem for Benatar, he thinks. And there's other options too. Um, you could interpret the worse off relation, the worse off relation as meaning that uh, non-existence would be preferable to existence. And then sometimes we do make that judgment. Um, sometimes we say, my life is not worth continuing. I'd be better off dead. Um, people sometimes make this choice when they have a terminal painful illness, right? This is the issue of euthanasia. Sometimes people think that is um, the morally right thing to do when someone is in constant excruciating pain to just put them into non-existence. That's the better situation, right? Um, when we make that judgment, we're not comparing states. We're not saying like, I mean, some people think, oh, I'd rather go to, he I'm going to go to heaven and I'd rather do that, right? But you don't have to believe in heaven to still make that judgment that you'd be better off not existing, right? Um, we're just saying that non-existence is better than what's going on right now, even though non-existence may be nothing, right? Um, sometimes it's just better to not exist than to be in certain states of appreciating pain. Um, okay, so we got a couple choices, right? The second choice 
um, brings up this issue, however, of lives not worth living, right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily straightforwardly apply to the issue of bringing people into existence, right? It, it plausibly is a different sort of case than someone who is um, choosing to right to die rather than to continue. So let's delve into that issue. What are what are lives worth living and not worth living? And how could it apply to uh, conceiving and giving birth? Well, Benatar wants to say there there is an important sort of like conflation there, and we have to pull apart two different concepts uh, that are captured by life not worth living um, that people often aren't aware of this difference, right? So there are lives not worth starting, right? So someone who has never existed and say, you know from genetic uh, information or whatever that if if this person were to come into existence, they, it would be a bad deal. They would have some terrible condition that would make their life not worth starting, right? Um, and then there are the lives not worth continuing, which is the sort of terminal illness sort of case, right? So these are, he calls the first future life cases and the other one present life cases. And he says, uh, the rules, our intuitions, they're actually different in these two kinds of cases. Um, life not worth continuing, where you're currently in existence and you say, I need to go out of existence. Uh, we have a pretty high standard for that. Uh, things have to be really bad, typically, for us to say, I would be better off dead if, if I'm already alive, right? It has to be something like the terminal illness um, that is so painful that it's, uh, right, day-to-day -day existence is some kind of torture. So, for ex example, right, if I were to lose a limb, um, I probably wouldn't say that that makes my life not worth continuing. I probably wouldn't ask for euthanasia. Um, but it's fairly normal for people to want to have an abortion if they find out that were the child, um, right, carried to term, it would be missing a limb. Um, so he wants to say, yeah, we have different intuitions in these cases. Maybe not everybody has different intuitions, right? Some people are very pro-life in that, um, they say no debilitating condition is a, uh, but he's saying in general, uh, you know, whatever, if you polled a bunch of people, probably they'd be more likely to say, yeah, I would have an abortion in the case of a missing limb, but I wouldn't end my life in the case of a missing limb. Right? Um, so if you buy all that, right, and you might not, you might want to push back on it in your essay. Um, he's saying sometimes it might be preferable not to begin a life even though it is worth living in the other sense, in the present life sense. So we have different standards in these different senses. Okay, let's pause to consider some objections. Um, Benatar considers a, an objection that he attributes to Derek Parfit, um, who says, look, <clears throat> the difference between the future life case and the present life case that he's saying is, you know, an important distinction that people miss, he says it's literally a split second, like right when you come out of the uterus, all of a sudden now it's a present life case. Um, so he says, what is the significance of that difference then, right? Um, a, a second before birth or after birth, right? He just seems to say that, right? Par Parfit wants to say, that's not really a significant distinction. And so your whole distinction between present and future life cases of life not worth living doesn't hold together. Well, Benatar responds and he says, no, no, I can agree with you, uh, Derek Parfit, that there is no significance to this split second of birth, right? Um, he's saying it's, it's sort of a continuous uh, issue. So there's a, continuously there's an expansion of your interests in staying alive, sort of the further you get from birth. Um, and again, so they say, you know, that makes sense of his intuition or people, and what he thinks is a generally shared intuition that you would might abort due to certain problems um, that you wouldn't consider a reason to end life as an adult. As you get older, you have more and more reasons to stay alive. Right? Interestingly, right, it, this does seem to imply that newborns don't have much, very much interest in staying alive. He doesn't say that, right, but he does seem to think that um, a one-month-old has less interest in staying alive than a four-year-old. Right? Maybe you want to push back on that, or maybe you would like to sort of help defend him and, and make sense of that. Right? All right, so on to our main argument. 
having set clarified sort of his stance on a few of these sort of issues, right? Um, all of these, all of those which are controversial, right? But he's at least clarifying where he stands. Um, if you accept that it's at least possible for coming into existence to be a harm, and he set up sort of some premises that would make that possible, now he wants to argue that coming into existence is always a harm, right? And to be clear, by always, he means any actual life, right? And this is because every actual life, every actual human has some bad in their life. You could imagine a life that's just perfect, right? Never, never experiences pain, right? Always has all their desires fulfilled or whatever, whatever it is, right? That is good and bad. I mean, that's conceptually possible, you might think, to have a life with no bad. Um, there's okay in that sort of conceptual possibility, um, then that sort of life would be about the same as not coming into existence, um, but any actual life is actually gonna be worse, right? There's always gonna be some bad. Book of Job, I don't know if you the Book of Job, he has a very bad life, right? All, all sorts of uh, uh, terrible things are visited upon him, um, but he is uh, sort of steadfast in his faith nonetheless. It's an odd book, right? It's strange where, where God is involved in that. He seems to be okay with visiting all these uh, horrible things on Job um, to prove a point. Okay. So, this claim that any actual life brings good and harm, that should be fairly straightforward. I don't think you need to be convinced too much of that, right? Sickness and death, they're unavoidable, various accidents. You're probably going to have your heart broken at some point in your life, right? You're probably going to bump your knee on something. Um, and these are only things, these pains and these sufferings, only living people are subject to those. Uh, non-existent people never bump their knee, right? Non-existent people never have their heart broken. They just don't suffer in that way. Now, you would be right to say that existence also brings a lot of good things, right? And you might say, well, if the good things outweigh the bad things, uh, then in that case, um, it would not be a harm to have been brought into existence, right? And remember, Benatar is arguing for this very strong claim. He's, he wants to say it's always a harm to bring someone into existence. Well, how could he deal with this case, right? Maybe some people's lives have more good than bad, right? Um, so he needs to argue that it's never the case that your life is better than a non-existent life, right? Which seems hard, right? But he says, here's, here's sort of the clever bit. Um, that claim is going to follow from an asymmetry that he points out between present and absent pains and present and absent pleasures. Okay, what is this asymmetry? Oh, my head is in front of one of them. Uh, but so I'll explain it to you. So here's sort of two scenarios. You exist or you never come to existence, right? Okay, well, um, the presence of pain is always bad right? And in any actual life, right? Scenario A, that's going to happen. You're going to have some pain. Um, if you never exist, you're always going to have the absence of pain, right? That's always going to apply and that's always going to be good. Now in any real life, you're also going to have pleasure, right? And that's good. And if you never exist, there will be the absence of pleasure. And that's the missing part that my head is over. But he says, well, the absence of pleasure nonetheless is not a bad thing. Right. And there's the asymmetry. An existing person has bad from pain, good from pleasure. A non-existing person has good from absence of pain and just sort of not bad from absence of pleasure. Right? And that's going to uh, be the key to this argument. So first, he wants to sort out. You might have some questions about how he's labeling these boxes. Right. How does he get that the absence of pain is always good, right? How does he get the absence of pleasure is not bad as opposed to some other way of describing it? So let's get into that. So how could the absence of pain be good for a non-existent person? Um, let's consider the situation for an existing person. Um, if I have a headache, I can say, man, it would be good for me if I didn't have that headache, right? Um, and the key is that applies even in a situation where not having the headache entails my not existing. Now, on the whole, 
right? You might not be convinced of that. You might say, no, I would like to exist right now, please. I just don't want the headache. But he's saying that part of the calculus, right? If you're adding up the goods and bads, right? Of uh, Should I exist or not given this headache, right? He's saying in the not exist column, right? The not having a headache part is a good. That's a check mark in the pro column of not existing, right? Um, so even if you think, well, I still want to exist, right? You do have to say, one good thing about not existing would be I wouldn't have a headache, right? That's a good thing. Um, and he says, if you accept that, then you should accept it. And the other sort of counterfactual where you have you have a non-existent person, right? And you compare that to a situation where they exist. Um, you want to say, well, non-existence is better in at least one, one respect, no headaches. That's good. He wants to label it as good. Okay, um, and he wants to back up these sorts of claims with a few intuitions. These are a few thought experiments, right? And he wants to say, the reason that you have intuitions in these cases is because my claim about um, absence of pain being good, right? And the absence of pleasure being merely not bad. Um, he wants to say, that account predicts certain intuitions, and here's the cases, tell me your intuitions, and I think you'll agree with me, right? Okay, so here's intuition one. We have a duty not to bring suffering people into existence, but we don't have a corresponding duty to bring happy people into existence. So here's Timothy Hutton and Kelly McGillis not existing, waiting to come into existence. Apparently, right, they've already fallen in love. I haven't seen this movie, Made in Heaven, it seems. Um, uh, Benzar kind of rejects that. That conception, right, of how it works, right? Um, he says there aren't people waiting in heaven just uh, begging to exist so they can be happy, and we have some duty to bring them all into existence. Um, he says, no, typically your intuitions are if you become pregnant and you know that your child is going to have a debilitating, painful condition, um, the intuition is the right thing to do is to abort that child. You don't want to bring a person to existence that's just going to suffer is bad um, but um, you're merely being capable of having a happy child were you to conceive one does not entail some sort of obligation to have children right it's still your choice whether you want to have a kid or not right just because you would be capable of having a happy child doesn't mean you're required to thinks there is some requirement to prevent bringing a child into existence that would just suffer um, so that seems to entail that again um, absence of pain, good thing, but absence of pleasure, there's not like any deep moral obligation to create, right, people with pleasure. Just neutral, it's not bad. Okay, another example, right? Um, the reasons you would offer for not having a child, right, in that case, because it has, you know, it's going to have some horrible condition, would be the suffering, right? You would say, I'm, you know, I'm choosing to abort this child because I don't want to bring a, a person into existence that's just going to suffer, right, for their whole life, right? Um, but if you did choose to have a child, you said, oh, you know what, I, uh, I think I'm capable of having a, a child. Me and my partner, we uh, we're financially stable, whatever. We're emotionally together. We think we can do a good job raising a child. Uh, we're going to do it. Um, typically, when you say why you want to have the child, it's not because you think you could create a happy being. Right, it's typically more something about you and your partner. You want to do this together. It's it's a, sort of a life thing that you want to do for yourself, right? He thinks um, you're not necessarily thinking about this non-existent being and thinking you have some sort of duty to create a happy being. Um, and he thinks similarly, if you if you have a child and then you end up regretting that um, choice, you're sorry for the child, right? Typically. Um, but if you don't have a child and regret not having the child, you're sorry for yourself, not the child, right? So again, these intuitions are supposed to be predicted by the idea that suffering that exists, bad thing, right? Not having it there would be good, um, but we don't feel this sort of regret about not creating happy being. If I don't have a kid, it's because of I, some sort of life project that I wanted to have that didn't, have, didn't work out. Again, another intuition. Um, he says you might regret the strangers on the other side of the world are suffering, right? If you hear about some natural disaster on the other side of the world, 
you might regret that. Um, but no one ever sits here regretting the fact that there's no happy people. No, there's no, all these non-existent people on Mars. Think of all the happy people that could be there, but there aren't. There's no one on Mars, right? Ah, oh, this is terrible, right? No one, no one worries about that, right? So again, he's saying there's not the same um, moral weight to the happiness of non-existent, the non-happiness of non-existent people. Okay, now he wants to consider some objections that people might have, right? Um, he says, well, that number four one about Mars, let's flip that around. Um, shouldn't we then, if right, if the, if the absence of pain is so good, shouldn't we be really happy for all the non-existent people who aren't in pain right now? Um, and he says, no, you're, you're misunderstanding it. I didn't say that we're like, when you consider the suffering of people on the other side of the world, that you're emotionally distraught. Um, right. So that this isn't like a happy versus sad situation. He said, we regret that suffering, but regret is not the same as feeling sad, right? That's just like, oh, that, I wish that wasn't the case, right? Um, this is not an emotional thing. So it's not so surprising that in the reverse case, um, you don't feel a strong positive emotion, right? For all the non-suffering, non-existent people, right? If somebody asked you, um you might say yeah i guess it's good that there's not more suffering in the world right but you it's not an emotional thing you want maybe that's a little fancy footwork he's doing there maybe you want to push back on that right maybe if that doesn't in in general when you're reading these articles and hearing me explain them right and you hear a reason you're like i don't know i don't know if i buy that sort of take note of that maybe jot it down these are potential paper ideas right if something strikes you as off um Jot it down and then start thinking about what's wrong. What could be wrong with it? Why does it strike you as wrong? Right. So I'm not saying that's wrong, but um, maybe some of you strike you as wrong. Maybe it's a potential paper idea. Okay. One other objection. Uh, suppose you're a utilitarian, right? And you want to say the point, right? Utilitarians want to increase total happiness, total pleasure in the world, and to do that, you need to bring lots and lots of people in the world. Lots of happy people get the sum total happiness through the roof, right? Um, Benatar wants to say, uh, I mean, that's one way you could interpret in utilitarianism, but he says it's not actually the most plausible one. Um, if you work through the details, it's actually the best way to conceive of utilitarianism is that the reason they value happiness is because it's a good thing for people, right? It's not like a good thing on its own. Free floating happiness isn't just a value in the world, right? What they want is like um, the people that exist to feel good. Right. So it's not the point is not to just crank out people so that we can maximize some abstract quality of happiness. What they want is happy people, the people that are here to be happy. All right. So that brings us to the final argument. So why is existence always a harm? Well, if you buy everything he said so far and you may not. Right. But it's, you know, it's a good article, smart. Smart fella and uh, some some convincing reasons here. The scenario, the, the scenario where X never exists, um, that person has no potential for bad, right? It's all good on the pain front, um, right? Plenty of potential for good. And then they just, the, at the worst, right, it's not bad. There's an absence of pleasure, sure, but that's not a bad thing. And you have potential for lots of good, lots of absence of pain, right? Whereas the existent person, they have lots of potential for bad and lots of potential for good, right? A lot of that's gonna cancel out. So um, any actual person, right? If they experience any pain whatsoever, um, they're worse off than the non-existent person. The non-existent person experiences no pain, right? And the fact that they don't experience pleasure, that's not a bad thing. Okay, so that's the argument, right? It took a lot to build up. You needed a lot of machinery. Um, but I think a lot of that machinery, conceptual machinery about like, what is the personal identity and right, when is coming to existence, uh, when is a life worth living and stuff like that, that all can be useful for you if you end up writing on the topic of abortion too, right? Uh, so I wanted to put that all out there. Um, and I also like, this is just such a sort of a surprising claim, sort of unintuitive claim that you may be struck by like, that can't be right. Something must be wrong with his argument here and I'm gonna figure out what it is and write a paper on that. Um, 
So I hope this, yeah, a little food for thought. And next week, we'll be moving on to another topic. We'll be talking about social ethics, particularly uh, ethics of affirmative action and some sort of definitions, accounts of racism, right? In the notion of institutional racism has sort of entered the zeitgeist a bit more. And um, we're going to explore what that means and if that's the best way to 